Okay, so let's continue. The mountain of instruction, Matthew chapter 4, verses 25 to chapter 8, verses 1. This is the sermon on the mount. But which mount? Like Sinai, another imaginary mountain, this imaginary mountain in Matthew, the site of the Sermon on the Mount, is a place where revelation comes from God to the community, the Matthean Jesus group, by means of a mediator, a broker. Jesus, a broker with alternate reality, puts people, clients, in touch with God, the author of the commandments, the patron, the patron. This is the normal Mediterranean process of patronage. Here in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, the unnamed mountain of instruction also manifests another characteristic of imaginary mountains. They can express a range of symbolisms. They are multivalent. This imaginary mountain symbolizes revelation and instruction, but also creation. And what is being created in the Sermon on the Imaginary Mount in the Gospel called Matthew? A new Jesus group is created here. A new community, namely the Matthean Jesus group. Hence, like other imaginary mountains, this one too is an umbilicus, or a place of creation. In this passage, Matthew once again echoes Old Testament themes, notably from Exodus chapter 19 through chapter 24. On this imaginary mountain, the Matthean Jesus is portrayed as a master who initiates others as disciples and transforms their status. Another mountain experience, the mountain of healing. Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 through 31. Moving on from there, Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, went up on the mountain, and sat down there. Which mountain? Not told. That's an alert for an imaginary mountain experience. Great crowds came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the deformed, the mute, and many others. They placed them at his feet, and he healed them. The crowds were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the deformed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind able to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Here on this imaginary mountain, the lame, maimed, blind, mute, and others are transformed from brokenness into wholeness, metamorphosis, metamorphosis. Jesus heals these people. Healing restores meaning to people's lives. There is a crucial distinction careful Bible readers must make between disease and illness, two interpretations of common to all human peoples. We all know sickness, but sickness gets interpreted differently according to different cultures. Our culture in the United States understands sickness as disease, or rather interprets sickness as disease. But the cultures behind the Bible, the, the Mediterranean world of, of the Bible, interprets sickness differently. It interprets, as, it interprets sickness as illness. And these distinctions between illness and disease, two different interpretations of sickness, are made possible because of medical anthropology. Sickness is one of many misfortunes in human life. And it can be viewed according to different cultures either as disease, or as illness. The disease view focuses on causes of sickness from a scientific biomedical perspective. It looks for germs, viruses, and the like, and seeks to find the silver bullet that will destroy the cause and restore health. 
But the illness view focuses on social consequences of a sickness event, both for the sick person and for family and community. The process of conquering a disease, scientific, biomedical, and unknown by the Bible, is known as curing. But the process of restoring meaning to life of a sick person and that person's family and community is known as healing. Modern science admits that cures are rare, but healing takes place always for everyone all the time. Everyone ultimately finds meaning in life. For example, in the Gospel called Mark, the Mark in Jesus first begins healing the paralytic by pronouncing that God forgives his sin and wants to revive their mutual intimate relationship. Your sins are forgiven. By addressing this man as son, Jesus publicly announces that the man is now a member of Jesus' fictive kinship group, his own family-like community. But when Jesus perceives that the scribes grumble because he acts like a broker on behalf of God, who alone forgives sins, verse 8, he takes yet a further step. He then heals the man's illness. Take up your mat and go home. Even here, Jesus demonstrates his primary interest is healing, not curing. By telling the man to go home, Jesus restores him to his own community. Regaining full membership in his own community and finding welcome in Jesus' community truly restores meaning to this group-oriented man's life. He is definitely healed. As with Mark in the Matthean Jesus healings, those who were excluded from worshiping in the temple are returned to the holy community of God by being transformed through the healing process. This scene, therefore, reports a recreation or a new creation, a renewed creation. The power Jesus wielded over every kind of brokenness, he also shares with the twelve. They are to continue the healing, continue the integration, continue the inclusivity Jesus has initiated. The imagery of Ezekiel chapter 34, where the mountain is a dangerous place where sheep get lost, sick, or injured, gets replaced with the hill of Yahweh's blessing. This scene may have provided Matthew with a model for this ritual of transformation. Hey, thanks for watching. Just continue the playlist for the next part of the study. If you have further questions, this is good. They will get addressed, so keep watching. If you found value, please subscribe, like, and share. As always, questions, comments, and criticisms are most welcome. God bless you.